Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is De uh, Dina Popovkina, and I will be uh, presenting the work that I've been doing in the lab of Dr. Scott Thompson downtown at UMB. Um, as Dr. Liu said, uh, my talk is about the effect of, cor of corticosterone and track B receptor downregulation on dendritic spine density. So that's a mouthful. Uh, let me break it down for you. Uh, we work with the hippocampus in our lab, uh, and it's a region of the brain responsible for declarative and spatial memory and learning. It's uh, defined um, or categorized by structural and functional plasticity, which means that um, it can change its structure and function in response to outside factors. It is susceptible to damage from trauma and seizures, and in the context of stress, they have found um, in post-mortem studies of clinically depressed patients that the hippocampal volume is reduced. Um, our model looks specifically at chronic early life stress in vitro. Stress acts on the hippocampus by means of the HBA axis, which you see in this diagram right here. Uh, so essentially, stress stimulates the hypothalamus, which in turn stimulates the anterior pituitary, which leads to the adrenal cortex to release glucocorticoids, which are stress hormones. Uh, they can feed back onto the hypothalamus, completing the HBA axis, or they can go to the hippocampus and produce some effect. So why do we really care about that? Well, actually, there are a lot of corticosteroid receptors in the hippocampus. So basically, there are a lot of receptors that can take in the stress hormones and produce some sort of effect. Um, we think that these effects would be deleterious because we saw that there would be a, hippo a reduced hippocampal volume in, in depressed patients. Um, there are certain factors that can produce beneficial effects in the hippocampus also. So this is the other side of our project. Um, specifically, neurotrophic factors promote neurogenesis, so the birth of new neurons and neuronal health. Um, track B, which is the receptor we're looking at, uh, is the dominant neurotrophic receptor in the hippocampus. The, uh, we have done a study um, looking at corticosterone and track B together, um, and this is a Western blot showing that corticosterone decreases track B mRNA expression. So looking at actin, uh, you can see that about the same amount of protein was loaded in both lanes. So this is the control group, and you can see there is quite a lot of track B expression. Looking at the corticosterone treated group, there's less track B that was expressed. So there's some sort of correlation between track B and stress hormone treatment. So our, prob our next problem in the project was to actually see how do we measure stress in an in vitro model. And we chose to look at dendritic spines for that. Dendritic spines are protrusions on a postsynaptic neuron that receive excitatory synaptic inputs. So in this electron micrograph, you see a spine here in red. It's receiving input from this presynaptic neuron in yellow, and the information is being transmitted along the postsynaptic density here in black. An increase in spines has been associated with memory, and the size and number of spines can change um, with response, as a response to outside factors such as hormones. So this seems to be ideal for our project. Based on the body of evidence we had, we hypothesized that stress hormones would reduce the density of dendritic spines in the hippocampus by downregulating the track B receptor. From this, we could predict that chronic corticosterone treatment, chronic stress, would decrease the spine density. Inactivating track B receptors, so taking away the benefits of getting a neurotrophin, would also decrease spine density. And supplementing the cells with a neurotrophic factor while also treating them with a stress hormone would bring back the spine. So we used organotypic hippocampal slice cultures uh, for this. So this is an in vitro method of looking at the hippocampus. Um, and we decided to do this to eliminate peripheral effects. So if you do this study in an animal, you could have uh, an effect such as an elevated blood pressure, which would um, affect your data. Uh, basically, by using an in vitro system, you eliminate that. So uh, a brief overview of making slice cultures is you dissect out the hippocampus, which you see here. And it looks like a loaf of bread. So what you do is you slice it up. Uh, you take each slice and place it on a cover slip in a clot of chicken plasma so it stays affixed. And then stick it in a culture tube with some media so it gets nutri nutrients. And then place it in an incubator at 36 degrees Celsius. Um, I left the cultures uh, to recover for a few days and then started my treatments. Um, so our mice were about a week old when we um, harvested the hippocampi from them. So this corresponded with the model of early life stress. And um, specifically, our mice expressed a green fluorescent protein and a mutant track B receptor, and I'll talk about those um, in a moment. I wanted to highlight that organotypic hippocampal slice cultures 
retain a network formation that has been widely characterized, as you can see in the pathways um, defined here. So this is a nissel stain of the hippocampus where you see the cell body stained in blue. Um, and you can see it's, the pathways are defined here. Um, because of that, at ev every slice that I looked at, I could see and identify the CA1 region, um, which we were specifically interested in because it received its, its inputs from CA3 neurons forming the Schaffer collateral pathway, which is integral for memory and learning. So because my cells express green fluorescent protein, I could image them with a fluorescent microscope because they glow green. Um, I could capture the images with a CCD camera and then analyze them with software. Um, I only took pictures of apical oblique dendrites. So what that means is I only looked at this subset of the dendrites, the projections from the cell body. And specifically, I looked at the side projections, which are the oblique dendrites. Um, in the CA1 cells. And I only um, quantified the segments that were greater than 25 microns in length to keep the integrity of my data. So the first treatment that I uh, administered was corticosterin, which is the main stress hormone in rodents, and its analog in humans would be cortisol. And this treatment should simulate chronic stress conditions. So on the left, you can see representative dendrites of um, the control group and the corticosterin treated group. And hopefully you can see there's little protrusions from the dendrite, and these little protrusions are actually the spines. So what I did is I counted each spine, took the length of the dendrite, and divided them to get the spine density. And you see it graphs here on the y-axis in spines per micron. The vehicle control is in blue, the corticosterin is in red. And I saw a significant decrease of 22% going from the control group to the stress hormone treatment. So from this, um, we could conclude that stress hormone addition led to fewer spines and in vivo would correlate to cognitive deficits. So that was the stress part of our project. We also wanted to look at downregulation of track B and how it would affect uh, the dendritic spines. So we played off of the fact that our mutant receptors are pharmacologically blockable. So this notation that you see here means that at amino acid position 616, a phenylalanine was changed to an alanine amino acid. Um, so this bulky phenyl group was removed, and the receptor became ATP analog sensitive. What that actually means is that, well, to give you some background, the TRAC-B receptor needs to be phosphorylated in order to um, uh, participate in neurotrophic signaling. Our mutant receptors have a slight change in the binding pocket because when you remove the phenyl group, you create a bigger space here. So under normal conditions, you can still get the phosphorylation that you need for neurotrophic signaling. However, when you have an ATP analog that's designed specifically to um, fit into this pocket, you get complete inhibition of phosphorylation, and this becomes the predominant form. So the inactive form of the receptor is predominant, um, and you get complete blockage of the receptors. So this is great for us because we had a drug um, from another lab that uh, could inhibit our mutant uh, receptors, and that was 1-NMPP1, and it's the competitive antagonist for our um, track B receptors. And this would test the connection between corticosterin and track B by simulating downregulation of the track B mRNA or something like receptor endocytosis. So the receptors are found on the outside of the cell. The cell might have taken the receptors back inside when it was exposed to the stress hormones. So uh, I've added the representative 1-NMPP1 dendrite here, and hopefully you can see that it looks more like the corticosterin dendrite than the control dendrite because it's got fewer protrusions. I have spine density and spines per micron along the y-axis here again. Vehicle controls in blue, one in MPP1 treatment in orange. So I saw that there was a significant decrease of about 14% going from the controls to the um, group that blocked the track fear receptors. So we can conclude that blocking the track fear receptors, taking away the benefits of a neurotrophin, also led to fewer spines and could correlate with cognitive deficits in vivo. Our last group um, used neurotrophin 4-5, which as a neurotrophin promotes neurogenesis and neuronal health, and on its own it has been shown to increase spine density. Um, it signals specifically through the track B receptor, which is why we chose it, and this treatment tests the effects of stress in the presence of the track B agonist, so something that promotes um, the um, effects of track B. So I've added the dendrite here on the bottom, and as you can see, this was our rescue group, so it should have looked like the control, hopefully, if our hypothesis predictions were right, but it looks more like the other ones, if anything. Um, you uh, see spine density on the y-axis and spines per micron again. 
vehicle control in blue, corticosterone stress hormone treatment group in red, and added neurotrophin in green. And my results for this experiment were not significant. So we couldn't really conclude anything about um, the effects of overloading tract receptors with a neurotrophic agonist. So I wanted to double check if my results were reasonable. If the effects we were seeing, which didn't really correspond to our hypothesis, were they really correct? Could I expect that? So I uh, assayed for uh, phosphotract B, which is the active form of track B, in the presence of corticosterone, added neurotrophin, 1-NPP1, which blocks, blocks track B receptors, and added neurotrophin there too. So Corticosterone gave some baseline uh, expression of phosphate track B, so there were some um, track B receptors that were activated. As soon as you add MT45, you increase the activation of phosphate track B, so you do have um, some signaling that's going on as soon as you add uh, the neurotrophin. 1-NPP1 abolished phosphate track B, and adding neurotrophin did not change that very much. And uh, any increase that you see going from 1-NMPP1 to the addition of neurotrophin in the presence of 1-NMPP1 is probably due to the fact that we use heterozygous mice. So not all of their receptors were mute, and some of them were well typed and could still um, respond to neurotrophin 4-5. So 1-NMPP1 abolished phosphate track B expression as expected. Neurotrophin 4-5 did increase phosphate track B in the presence of corticosterone, but this effect must not have been sufficient for rescue because I could not see anything visually in the cells when I looked at the dendritic splines. So we concluded that the effects of chronic stress may be partially regulated by track, uh, partially mediated by track B downregulation. Chronic corticosterone, so chronic stress, um, decreased spine density. Inactivating the track B receptors also decreased spine density. And neurotrophin reversed these effects to some degree. And I have started looking at um, some other players in the stress response, such as corticotropin-releasing hormone. Um, it's abundant in early postnatal hippocampus, so it's a good um, target, well, possible target. Uh, it could have been our missing player, uh, which could um, be a reason for why I didn't see any significant results in my last experiment. Um, and as you can see, uh, this is the part of the stress response that I had been looking at, and corticotropin-releasing hormone is um, actually upstream in the stress response. And so far, the corticotropin-releasing hormone treatments that I have seen are not any different from the vehicle controls. And I'm currently uh, doing a Western blot to look at track B expression and phosphate track B, so the active track B expression. Um, I don't have any results from that yet, but we'll see. So far, it doesn't look like CRH is the answer, but um, the Western blot will tell all. So I would like to thank Dr. Scott Thompson, um, my mentor, and Lee Peng Mok, um, our former lab technician, um, HHMI Scholars Program, and Marky Star for funding, and all of you for listening. And uh, are there any questions? So why did you decide to look at um, apical reflex stress? Yes. So the problem with expressing GFB, even though GFB is expressed selectively in our cells. It's under a promoter that only expresses it in a subset of cells. There's a lot of background noise. So looking at just apical oblique dendrites gives me a stretch of the dendrite that's thin enough that I can count the spines without thinking, oh, is the dendrite blocking some of them? Because it's the dendrite is in 3D, so when you take a 2D picture of it, if the dendritic shaft is very thick, then you can't really see some of the spines. The apical oblique dendrites, um, not only receive um, input from the C3 cells, so that's the pathway we wanted to look at, but they also give me the resolution that I want um, in the image. I have one quick question yeah. for you. Uh, why do you use rather than That's a good question. So actually, we started out with heterozygous mutants in our lab. That's the, cell, uh, that's the mouse line that we had. Um, we have started switching over to homozygous, because um, looking at the results, we realized that we probably should be using um, homozygous track B mice, and um, my new experiments have started switching over to homozygous. Thank you. Thank you.